It's so loud. Um, all right. So uh, thank you, everybody. Um, this is the um, Kubernetes uh, work group device management meeting for May 28th. Um, let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, so um, I think uh, we wanted to talk about the scope that uh, I think Patrick, Kevin, him and I are proposing um, for 131. And what we've tried to do is stack rank the items um, and we've drawn a sort of tentative cut line. Of course, the question is whether we can actually deliver it. Um, we don't know um, yet, but this is what we're targeting. And um, I've said this, I think, a few times, but I think we're probably a few weeks behind where we should be uh, in making this decision. Um, but uh, we're going to keep trying, and we'll see where we land. Um, and then, Sergey, you had um, an item on here, so we'll try and reserve some time for that. What do you think that'll take, time-wise? Maybe 10 minutes will be enough. Okay. It may well come up in the other discussion, too, because this is kind of one of the items, but I haven't looked at your yeah. documents. I, don't know what I really hope if we can fit at least anything uh, in 131 regarding reporting of status. Okay. All right, awesome. Um, okay, so there's this document here. It's it's linked. I don't know why I'm signed out, but I better sign in. Uh, there we go. Um, so uh, we worked on this document last week uh, to try to come to some kind of narrowing of the scope of something we think we can deliver um, or hopefully deliver and uh, help us guide. And the goal would be then we have an API, of course, discussion going on about how to uh, implement this, but this helps this helps downscope that API. Um, and so feel free to interrupt at any point. Like this is a try, trying to have a discussion with the rest of the community. Tim and Patrick and Kevin and I have all talked about this a lot. Um, I don't know that it's 100% resolved in here, but it could be useful to get everybody's feedback. So um, we divided this kind of into three. I don't think it's in, yeah. Into, into four different, at least four different areas, uh, capacity model, uh, class and claim model, so how the user, uh, end user interacts and the administrator, um, the allocation model and scheduling alg algorithms. So this is kind of where Sergey, the status kind of starts to fit in a little bit maybe. Uh, and then things we need to do in the driver um, over the course of that. So starting with the capacity model, um, we want to obviously maintain the parity with what is in um, the named resources model in 130. So that's uh, on the table. Um, and then the new functionality kind of stack rank, um, <laughs> kind of hand wavy thing of extension points necessary to do all the stuff below the stack rank line. And then um, some API usability things like uh, uh, right now, We've sort of list all the attributes for every device, even if they're all the same. We could potentially pool those up. It might be simpler. But there may be some usability things and, and naming changes. And those are the things that we know we have to do for sure. Um, more, most of the changes you'll see coming up are on the claim side. Um, but the, the, we, we do believe that partitionable devices um, for MIG is important. So that's the top of our, our next tier. Um, these are the things we hope to get in. Um, and then I guess here's where this, the the uh, there's two places we want to do status, Sergey. One is um, status of a device independent of a claim. So, you know, just the node looks at the device and it says this device is healthy or not, and it, and it records that back in the control plane. Uh, that's handled today by just if the device is unhealthy, we just remove it from the pool, which works from the scheduling point of view, but is not as easy for you to troubleshoot what's going on, why the device isn't showing up. 
Um, so this one that's in the capacity model is that. It's just, uh, I don't, it's not associated with any particular claim. It's just whether the device is there and it's healthy or not. And then uh, there's some uh, uh, debate over this, but network attached devices, um, so devices that aren't associated with a particular node, uh, but could be accessed by multiple nodes over the network, are a different type of device uh, that would require a different type of capacity model, um, or at least um, additional metadata in our capacity models, excuse me. Um, and so that's a separate item. Things we've already determined, we probably couldn't deliver even if we wanted to. Um, allocatable device resources. So this is what we've talked about previously here where a device itself uh, has a certain amount of memory and we can allocate some of it. Even if the device doesn't enforce the allocation, from a scheduling point of view, we can allocate it and use it to share or fractionally share a device. So basically, this excludes fractional sharing of devices. Uh, it, it, um, it also implies um, the same data is the data that would be used to make a statement like, I need somewhere between one and four devices, but, uh, and I don't care as long as they're all the same vendor, but they need to have aggregate memory greater than 128 gigs. We wouldn't be able to do that kind of claim because we wouldn't have the underlying data uh, to make that decision encoded in a way that we know that that's what that data is. Like we could stick it in attributes for other reasons for like filtering, but it wouldn't be semantically kind of structured in the model such that we can make that kind of a um, statement or request. Um, so that's what we're losing with allocatable without doing this, but I just don't see us as having time to do it. Um, so um, the, there was some talk of a pool of identical resources. We're not going to do that. So this is the difference is that rather than the scheduler picking the individual devices for the pod, um, the, the scheduler picks a number of them and just lets the driver pick. Uh, we're not going to cover that use case. Um, the use case of device instantiation, this is where we would do things like creating uh, a VLAN interface or a Linux bridge interface. We're not going to cover that use case. You could take a PF or a VF, something that's modeled as a physical device, and you could attach config to it, which would say uh, potentially attach it to a, a, a VLAN. But we're not going to say create a whole VLAN virtual switched virtual interface or something out of whole cloth. That's not going to be within the, within the thing. Deposit device model. Um, we're also not going to do this. This is. On the model side, we have a GPU and a NIC that go together. They cannot be consumed independently. We will have on the claim side, or we hope to have, the ability to say we want a GPU and a NIC, and they have to be on the same PCIe route. That's a different. That's putting it on the user to make this association. This is a different th idea where we would put it on the, the node um, architect who's creating the VM to be able to encapsulate in that directly. These two go together, and you can only consume them as a unit. That's not going to be in the in the 131. Dynamically attachable devices. Um, these are ones that have some sort of lifecycle process to attach to a given node, either some forms of the network devices that are not, say, shared. Um, or like iSCSI, at least how it used to work. I don't know how it works today. Um, but also uh, this PCIe-based disaggregated devices. Um, any kind of access mode controls in the capacity model. There would be some available in the client model, but not the capacity model. Um, and then one item, which is uh, being able to note whether a device is has some sort of performance degradation. So uh, we only probably will have healthy or unhealthy, not not um, healthy, but you know, running at half speed. Uh, any questions? That's the capacity model. So this is the this is kind of the, the hoped for scope. I think issues to resolve in this, um, you'll see the comments here, um, uh, whether this is really necessary. And then there, there's this one. Uh, so if, you know, if anybody has thoughts on either of these um, and, you know, wh whether this needs to be above the cut line isn't probably another, another um, discussion.
my uh, okay no comments all right um keep moving uh claim and class model so uh this is our api for making the request so the other api was for the driver vendors or the device vendors to publish what's available this is the api for the end user to ask for something um Again, uh, existing uh, 130 features need to stay. Um, but the new functionality here um, is uh, we're hoping to do some improvements on the UX. But one thing we we did decide, um, and I think Tim sent out an email to the mailing list, so many of you may have seen it, um, is that the, um, the our focus will be on expressibility, not usability. And in a later release, we'll focus on usability. So what does that mean? So it means that sometimes there'll be a, a lot of YAML you have to write that you, we hope to make simpler later, but uh, we don't have the bandwidth to both come up with something that's expressive enough to cover the use cases and very succinct and tight and flexible, uh, you know, it's kind of simple for the use, simple use cases. We have ideas around that, but there are limits on what we can actually deliver. Um, and so we're trying to um, focus right now on the expressibility with the belief that we can improve the, um, uh, the usability later. Sorry. Um, okay. Next is the um, so we've having we've been having a debate on what classes are for. Um, and I don't necessarily want to get into all this right now unless people have strong opinions. Um, but anybody who does is interested is welcome to join us. Basically, we're trying to decide uh, how classes should be used whether there's just a um, sort of set of preset constraints can, and configuration that claims can access, um, or whether they're uh, fundamental to access control. Um, I think we've decided based on scope, if nothing else, that classes should not be fully as fully expressive as claims. What does that mean is that you can't, the administrator can't create a cluster scoped class, which says, give me four, of this particular model um, or two of this particular model with this particular topological arrangement and then have users just refer to that class and get that kind of constellation of um, resources that that's uh, not the purpose of classes um, and instead they're more around um, very broad Kind of per device just, rather than rather than multiple devices. Yeah, yeah. They're like constrain. They constrain the the set of possible devices on an individual device basis, but not like managing the set of devices that gets gets chosen. Uh, constraints on those. So that's one of the 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 next sort of feature is one thing we don't have in one thirty right now is the ability to um, sort of allocate a set of devices and then put a set of constraints on that and put some constraints on that set of devices. So what are, we can allocate an individual device and say, here's a device. Um, we want to be able to say, give me four devices and those four devices have to have some constraint on them. And the constraints that we're talking about allowing in this particular release would be some sort of attribute match. So if you recall in our capacity model, each device publish, publishes a set of attributes, vendor model, that can include things like PCIe um, root complex or um, some sort of topological indicator that the vendor makes up, but has some meaning intranode. Um, ideally, those are a set of those that are cross vendor and cross type of device. That way we can say, give me a NIC and give me a, a GPU on the same PCIe root complex. So what we're proposing in 131 is that we allow you to, to, to allocate an explicit set number of devices, so not a range. We're not going to say, give me one to four devices, because we have no 
constraints to control which we would choose in this in this release. Instead, it's just give me either one, two, four, eight, whatever it is, and within that set, constrain it by making sure that these these attributes all match. That could be they're all the same model. That could be they're all on the same PCI. It could be both. Right? It could you could have both of those constraints. That's the limit of expressibility on the claim side for for uh, for that. The next um, use case, these are stack ranked, remember, uh, is management access mode. So this is, um, it's like I can select, uh, well, first of all, th this is a way of selecting a set of devices on a node and associating them with a pod. So we get all the machinery that, that tags them to a pod and allows the driver to mount them in the pod and all the stuff that it needs to do, but we don't allocate them from a scheduler point of view. I mean, we'll keep track of that. We have this, but we won't take them out of the pool of devices that are available to satisfy regular claims. So this is used for monitoring type of workloads or other management workloads that um, uh, essentially are, are not the user workloads, but are some sort of administrator workloads. So this would have controls on it such that it requires special privileges to be able to do this. Um, and it would have more limited, um, at least there's no requirement for it to have the same expressibility. So I don't need to be able to say, give me four. Like there's no, there's no point in that. It's typically give me all of the devices, maybe on the node, maybe all the, of a particular model might be uh, on some, in some cases, a constraint you put, but typically it's just like, give me all of the devices managed by this driver on this node. Um, there's a, a, a later requirement that's not in scope, which is like, I have a claim for these four devices. Give me another pod that's a management pod for those same four devices. That's a sort of linked claim thing. We're not going to be doing that in 131. Um, last on our uh, I guess hope to <laughs> hope to deliver. I, I, I'm reading it. I'm thinking this is um, perhaps overly ambitious. Um, is some we need ideally we need to implement some access control and quota, but at the very least we need to have a very clear understanding of how we will implement it, even if we don't actually do implement it, but we have the, the effectively the API to buy. Um, in our next. Category, uh, things we've already determined we may not be able to deliver, but we like our stretch goals effectively. We have um, support or hooks for allowing CRD driven claim generation. So this is how 130 works today. Is um, I mean, you don't have to use the CRDs, but mostly people would, where you create a CR that represents, that say, a, say an NVIDIA CR that represents the configuration um, and selection of your um, criteria for your device. And there's a control plane side controller that processes that CR and emits um, uh, a resource claim parameters today, but effectively sort of model wise, it's effectively a claim. Um, this would be a similar kind of, of thing where we would, but we would do it in a way that uh, it's more optional to flow. Um, things we've already determined out of scope. Um, Actually, this I think we're still we're still debating. Um, we, we we you know whether we come up with some kind of common. We, we know we need certain common attributes. How we reserve those names and all of that, and what process we have, we still need to figure out. Um, one thing that's out of scope we've talked a lot about in this group is um, a preferential list of ways to satisfy a claim. I'll take one. Um, you know, H100 or one A100 or two L4s like on the same PCIe route, that kind of preferential list of ways to satisfy a claim um, is, is not something we'll be able to deliver, but it's definitely something we want to deliver at some point. Um, one of the other things we had in some of our prototypes we've talked about is this idea of um, either device types or device capability vectors or ways to have like a vendor neutral, in particular for, 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 for uh, FIOB virtual functions, you want a way to have a uh, uh, vendor neutral 
way to express that. Depending on some of the decisions around class, we might be able to do some of that, but we're not, that's not something we're specifically targeting to deliver. Uh, this is basically a consequence of that. Okay. Okay, so here's one thing we've talked a lot about in this group as well. I wanted to make clear, uh, we, we talked, I mentioned a minute ago, we are gonna give you the ability or we hope to give the ability to allocate a set of devices, but it's gonna be a, a fixed number. And then you can put some constraints across that fixed number. Additional future functionality would include different ways to allocate that set, um, where instead of giving a fixed number, you can give a range. If you give a range, you need to give some way to, to make a choice within that range. Otherwise, we'll just always give you one. Um, and that would be uh, something like the aggregate memory. So that kind of uh, use case um, we're not going to be covering. Um, yeah, Antonio. Yeah, no, that's the part because the, the, the set is the same device type or set of multiple devices. Or... <laughs> I know that this topic is with yeah, compound. Great and the no, no, great, great question. question. Like, Go ahead. I, can jump up that one I think it depends on what, what selection criteria you put in place. If your selection criteria narrows you down to a specific vendor or a specific type of device, then that's what you get. But if your selection criteria doesn't, then the scheduler is free to pick anything that matches your selection criteria, which could but potentially with, be from different vendors or whatever. With, with the example of, of um, you can put an example, I think that's clear for me. With the typical GPU plus NIC example, right? Can I say, I want these GPUs with these NICs? Um, express that with with this approach? Yeah, yeah. so let, let's differentiate between, when I say a set of devices, or a dev, I don't know what's a device set here, like, I, I, I think there's probably, we're still working on the details of the API, so what, what Kevin said, depending on the way, whether we require a driver or not, uh, or depending on how the, the constraints are constructed and what the required constraints are, um, my expectation, uh, let's roll it back. My expectation would be that when we're talking about different device types, we would use different claims. And those different, so this would be, there's a difference between allocating a set of devices within a single claim and having okay. multiple claims that are required to, to satisfy the pod and being able to apply a set of constraints across those claims. Okay, and so that, the, 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 let me, let me, because I need to understand, sorry for interrupting. The, the, the set is, is a scope to the claim, right? In this particular formulation, that's how I was thinking of it. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't mean that that's what everybody, the, the four of us were, who were working on the document together all had the same idea in mind. It looks like Patrick had a hand, so. Yeah, so my thinking is that in a claim, you can select different, you can specify multiple requests. Each request has a selector that gives you one device type. So you could have one request that says, I want a GPU. The second request in that claim could be, give me a NIC. And then you have these constraints that make sure that these two different device types share some common, common attribute. And then inside each request, you can say, I want more than one. So you could ask for five GPUs that are all alike, and it would be a single request with a count attached to it. And then you get more than one one device. That's how I've been thinking about it. No, yeah, I, I think, think that, that makes that's, sense. Go ahead. That's, sorry, that's consistent with Antonio. I think it was on Friday or Thursday, we had that long Slack thread going where it started off talking about nickel as an example, but then it diverged into a whole bunch of other stuff. I think what Patrick just described is the exact uh, a uh, bit of YAML that I put in there for how you would ask for a NIC and a GPU and match them on a on a, on a certain attribute and potentially add other constraints that said, make sure that if I do this across different pods, they all come from um, the same rack or the same um, domain or whatever. Yeah. There's a, there's a technical reason. Inside a resource claim, we can experiment with an API to, de to express these cross device constraints. This kind of experimentation is very hard to do across claims because then it needs to be in the pod spec, which is the core API. We don't want to experiment there. Yeah, that that's where I got confused. Thank you, Patrick and Kevin. Like, we 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 had to push 
all of it. We had to add a tier. We had to add a claim, and, a, and within the claim, there are multiple requests so that we had a place to attach these constraints that's not in the V1 pod spec. So I was I was thinking back to the older when we were trying to do it with claims. Runal? So in, in real world cases, will we have scenarios where a workload will actually work with uh, GPUs from different vendors? Like, okay, I'm fine with two NVIDIAs and one Intel and one AMD, or uh, it's only gonna be same vendor. If it's gonna be the same vendor, are we standardizing on the attributes? Well, let's, 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 let's put it this way. The, the framework that we're putting together here in theory, would allow the scheduler to select GPUs from different vendors. As long as your constraints didn't constrain you to a specific one and it matched whatever constraint you had, the scheduler could, in theory, pick it from different vendors if those were available in your cluster somewhere. But I think in practice, you probably want to be specific about what type of GPU you're getting. Um, yeah. Unless your application itself has logic built in to be able to detect, oh, what was injected? It was an AMD GPU. I'm going to do this. It was an NVIDIA GPU. I'm going to do that. But that logic would need to be in the application itself based on what it was actually given. It, that, that makes sense. And one more question, maybe I missed in the details. Are we going to standardize on the attributes that are required to be published by the drivers? Yeah, like we're still debating name or something. Under discussion. Yeah, I think the way John put it earlier was, in short, yes, we want to standardize on some set of attributes, but how we're going to do that is what we're still debating. Um, what the right methodology for that is hasn't been agreed on yet. We, we yeah, need to design the APIs of we, that we can standardize. That is in scope for what we are trying for 131. Actually, defining standard attributes, in my opinion, is not because that needs further debate. Which attributes are actually common? How useful are they? So that would be something that then gets done later. Yeah, yeah so we think we words, need that. How, how, yeah. how we do it should be defined now. We should, but but what we actually standardize, we don't know yet. That would that would be pushed out. Yeah, and by how Kevin means like the, the API, like like we're talking about whether we have to qualify certain attribute names or not, you know, and things like that. That that and, and if we do qualify. We don't qualify the standard ones, then how do we know they're standard? Like, how do we store that? Like, so there's just debate on, on the details of that. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Arun? Yeah. Hey, uh, another question. So, is, is matching constraints across vendors, is it still in scope for 131? Yes. So, so like Patrick was saying, in a given claim, you can have a request for a NIC and a request for a GPU, which are likely to be from different vendors. And then you can attach a constraint that says, uh, this is that, that's the, uh, let me just scroll up. That's this right here. So, so maybe I need to clarify this. It's not quite clear. Um, Within a, this is talking about within an individual request, but I didn't talk about a cross request, so that's that's a missing bullet point. Um, the the idea would be you, you have a claim, claim requests a NIC, claim requests a GPU, and it associates a constraint across requests for matching attributes. Now, in order for that to work across vendors, you need the vendors to define the attributes in the same way. So, if PCIe root complex is you know, some there's some value that represents the PCIe root complex on that particular node um, that that particular oh. card is attached to. Then we need the each vendor to publish that in exactly the same way with exactly the same name and exactly the same value, or we can't do the match. And so that's the um, that's the discussion we're having about what do we standardize and how do we represent those standard things within the, the API. I see. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, so, uh, so that's clear. Let me um, just take a quick note. Constraints across requests versus constraints across um, within within requests within a set of devices that's in a single request. I need to note that separately. 
John, I just sent you a, on Slack um, an example of what we're talking about in the ML. All right. Cool. Yeah. 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 I just didn't capture it well in the doc here. Okay. Um, I just meant if you want to pop it up real quick so that people see. Oh, oh, oh I see. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a lot more complicated than you think because I'm on two different machines and oh, okay. I'm on Slack on this machine. So um, if you want to display it, I can stop displaying. No, it's okay. I think, yeah, we can point people at it afterwards. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so so uh, when we're talking about th th this particular highlighted item on the screen, this is about constraints for devices allocated as part of a single request, not constraints across. I mean, some of them might, actually it's mixed, it's both. So the first one, the split allocation, I can't imagine ever doing that other than within a single uh, request, but the distinct attribute constraints. So this is just the, the, the complement of the match attributes, match attributes saying they have to be on the same PCIe root complex. The distinct attributes would say some attribute value has to be different, typically, what we imagine this would be used for um, is like, I need to make sure that these, these VFs all land on different PFs or these PFs even land on different actual physical cards because a physical card could have multiple PFs on it. So like that is a redundancy type of requirement in networking where you'd say, I'm gonna create, I'm gonna give this, this pod for network interfaces, but I want them to be, have some um, physical, um, be on physical, different physical uh, failure domains. So that, that we're not planning on doing, it's not hard to do, it's just we didn't have a strong requirement for it. And, and um, so it hasn't, this is just one more thing we'd have to build and test. Um, there's one other one um, that could be implemented in different ways. This is kind of one way to implement it. There's probably other ways to implement it, but, but that's the idea that if I ask for four devices as a single request, um, based on the way CUDA works today, you, you can only, only one of those could be a make and have it actually work. And so, um, and so, uh, we would need a way to find that constraint. We're not going to try to implement that. Well, I guess maybe a distinction people should have in their heads is that when we're talking about allocating things as part of a single request, that means that you would take them and you would associate them with a single container, typically. Um, is that accurate, Kevin? Did that? Did I? Did I say it again, sir? So we we did. Well, this gets back to the two 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 key name thing within within the pod spec today. Uh, what we would do is we can attach an individual request to a container, but we can't attach a sub device of a request to a container. And right. so, not in one thirty. Uh, oh, oh, well, and we're not proposing to do it in one thirty one either, are we? Like, I think it may be Patrick and saw something about it. We have it. We have it in the proposal. I okay. I, I, I'm not okay. That sounds like probably more than we need. Like, like let's talk about that later. But my, the, the distinction I was trying to make was between when we have cross request constraints and we have within request constraints. What's the reason for a request? A request is the at least in prior iterations of the proposal, a request was our sort of lowest level of granularity of what you can attach to a container. Um, so, uh, at yeah. least in 130 and previous versions, it sounds like we have a, a latest version actually allows you to go deeper than that. We'll have to discuss whether that's- No, no, uh, it, would still be, it would still be per request. It's just that the way that Patrick has formulated requests is you've got a claim with multiple requests. And so either you can inject everything from the claim and then you just reference the claim and tied to your container claim section. Or I think the latest one has an index as well, Kevin. Um, uh, right, which, yeah, yeah, that's yet another level. Is that, is that what you're referring back to then? Okay. I, I think that's in the latest one Patrick sent over the weekend or something, yeah. Is that right, Patrick? I suggested the index because it's, it is missing if we add the count. Uh, it's not in the actual PR text yet just in a comment okay okay i'm not sure if we have a use case for that we have to see we can discuss it um okay uh i'm gonna try to get through the rest of this quickly because i want to give sergey time here um claim side of allocatable ice resources 
nothing controversial there. Linked claims, I talked about that. So those are the things that are out. Allocation model and scheduling algorithms, um, existing 130 features. Um, what's your comment, Antonio? Did you? The, the status thing. The status, um, yeah. So that's here in the allocation model right here. Um, so after a claim is made, right? There's any, the, the user makes the claim. The system acts on the claim and matches it to some capacity and allocates that capacity has to record that allocation. That's our allocation model. As part of that, that then that has to get actuated. That has to get actually um, provisioned on the node by the driver. Once the driver makes that provisioning, it needs to write a status back to let the user know that it was successful in provisioning that claim on that node. That's what this highlighted status is right here. I don't think we have this in 130 right now. And there's some discussion and debate on how we would implement it, like just from a mechanical point of view of our API infrastructure and how it works. Um, but this is, like, as far as I know, uh, what Sergey wants to talk about as well. So in the beginning, I mentioned we would have, it's, it's kind of like, in my opinion, lower priority than this. We have this just a device is healthy or not because we can already we already do that in 130 by just removing it and so it's sort of just a troubleshooting thing the this is actually more for the end user they schedule it it gets scheduled it goes to run and the pod fails why is it failing well they could go back and look at the this condition and they could say oh it's failing because i included a configuration that's invalid or it's failing because i don't know something's wrong with the device right like the, the, they'll get some kind of condition status back saying, I'm unable to pro fully provision your claim on this device, and here's why. Um, any comments or thoughts on that? Does that cover, Antonio, what you're thinking of? No, wait. The, all the networking people wants to add pod IPs and all this stuff there. That would be the same place. Um, so really, um, uh, yeah, that would be the same place. And we haven't, uh, but uh, yeah, um, we should have that discussion probably offline. We, uh, yeah. we don't have any design how to do that at the moment. So it's not, car it's not currently in the proposal. We just decided that it's in scope but someone still needs to come up with a, yeah, with a way how to deal with the security implications, for example. But, but I, I saw you are update, Patrick, that you reached an agreement with Jordan, David, and other people that using a model similar to the, the, to the current... Yeah. So mm. I, I just wanted to ask, is this related or not? It is related. The problem is that the admission, validating admission policy probably can't restrict rights to device claims because it would need a similar logic to the node authorizer. So we know how to do the right, we don't know how to do it securely. Okay, so the, the blocking part is how to do it securely. Okay, thanks. I'm not sure whether it's a blocker. If we just accept that any node tries oh, okay. to right. any claim, then <laughs> we, can, we can do that. Okay. For alpha, that might be sufficient, but we should have a plan for how to get past that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, more sophisticated scoring algorithm. So uh, Kevin added this here, but I think what you're thinking, Kevin, is just that we need to score based on the device choice. Is that what you're you're thinking there? We don't score right now at all in 130. Yeah, it's very, very primitive. Yeah, what we do today. Just I know Patrick has some plans to add at least some minimum scoring in the um, in this no. release. No, I, I want to none add at all, none at all now. I thought you wanted to add backtrack. Sorry, you want to add the backtracking, but not actual yeah. scoring. For scoring, we need some way of specifying what's best, and that just can't be built in because all of the attributes are opaque. The, the, the scheduler really doesn't know what's better than some other solution. This has to be configured somehow. Because we don't have any allocatable resources, we don't have any way to, to score other than, and we don't have any preferential one of this, this, and this, there's no differentiation. I see what you're saying, Patrick. Yeah. Um, there's not really a way uh, 
a way to score uh, in in one thirty one based on the data we have. Yes, we we and have the a semantic meaning behind the attributes. Yeah. We we but know no where to put it, it, and there there is there is a way of how to how a sale expression could be added later on that does the scoring, but there's no design at this point. Well, there's no data like. There's there's no data to make a decision on, right? Like there is data. We... Are the attributes one 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 easily or one thing that I can f find very realistic is my devices must or my GPUs must have a minimum amount of uh, memory, but give me the smallest GPU that satisfies that requirement because memory is expensive and I'm I have I have a quota that limits how much memory I can use in the right. cluster. So, but then, and then we have the attribute. We do know what, how much memory an individual instance has. We just need to have a set expression that sums up the memory, this attribute, and tries to minimize that value. I mean, that, that yeah, okay. Well, anyway, yeah, that's one way. Like that, that require. Well, anyway, we'll talk about it later. It's, it's not. I mean, set expression is memory is a different beast, and I think we've talked about it a different way in the past, but. It's not in scope for this release, so let's it's not in scope. Yeah. just leave that on the table. <laughs> so let me let me then bump this down because we don't even have any. I think it's out of scope. Yeah. Oh, the right screen. All right. Um, okay. Um, all right. Then. Um, Yeah. Okay. Let's. Uh, so on the driver side, uh, this is it. We're last couple items. Tim, thank you for the time check. I'll just take two minutes. Um, new functionality in scope, scope saying, right? So publication of allocations to workload. So we need some way to tell. We're picking the scheduler's picking the devices now, not the driver. We need some way to communicate that all the way down to the workload. We might need it in downward API. We don't know yet. We this may already be covered in the driver. But there's some debate over whether it is. Um, uh, the status thing we already talked about. Um, there's API, Kubelet plugin API changes there, like we needed. Um, and then out of out of out of scope is some way for drivers to work together and create a composite device. We talked about this earlier, compound device that would have a um, a driver side component as well. So that's it. Um, any quick questions, or shall we let Sergey have the remainder of the time? Okay, no no major heartburn over all the stuff we're cutting out. Good. All right, uh, Sergey, jump jump in. I'll stop. I'll stop sharing. Yeah, you can make me co-host if you want me to share. Um, okay. Yeah, when you said uh, no major uh, problems, like I mean, yeah, I, I wish we had more, uh, but uh, I think it's okay. Um, so right. I just want to bring this uh, topic of uh, failure monitoring, and I I think it's. Uh, on the mind of uh, many people already. I don't uh, bring anything new here and uh, uh, most topics were already discussed before. Let me start to share my screen. Sorry, I'm working on getting you to be host. Okay. Why is it not more? Yeah, I have a link uh, from an uh, agenda so everybody can just open go. a document and follow along. You're host um, now, you're a host now. Okay. And I was mostly looking uh, looking at device uh, uh, plugin, not on DRA. I get to look at DRA failure model, but I'm pretty confident it will be the same. So what we have today is uh, uh, failure handling is very poor uh, in device uh, land. Uh, today, you if you schedule something and it failed to schedule, you kind of stuck with the spot. Uh, if you if uh, some device failed. It's uh, on the mercy of pod itself to fail. And uh, if it's a job and uh, it has a restart policy uh, never, then you're likely to be rescheduled. If uh, it's a, a on failure restart policy or even like inference, which is of course, which is uh, always restart, then you're stuck with this um, 
port and uh, we wouldn't even try to reallocate device even if there is an, another device on this node that is healthy we wouldn't even try to reallocate we just uh, keep trying with the same device over and over again so many customers have different uh, hacks around it so some uh, more elaborate they looking for specific ports and uh, using uh, some things like um, uh, like this API get uh, allocatable get uh, device get resources uh, get preferred pod resource API. yes yes oh, pod so they, yeah so pod resource api is a using pod resource api and uh, understand which pods are allocated to unhealthy gpus and then they will uh, do some logic like uh, delete this pod uh, some customers are a little less elaborate and they just uh, look at allocatable look at what needs to be allocated on this device and if it doesn't match meaning that something is unhealthy then they will just nuke the node and a cloud provider will create a new node for them. So there are different strategies how people work around this, but uh, neither of them is good. Um, and uh, all of them requires a lot of, uh, uh, I, I mean, some hacking around and uh, it's not a b good shape to be in. So um, there are multiple failure modes you want to uh, explore. Uh, there is fail failure to allocate, failure to uh, create container when a device is allocated already. Um, there are some permanent device failure uh, when a device is not available any longer and wouldn't uh, be available any longer. Today, device plugin cannot tell that. It can only tell unhealthy. Uh, it cannot tell like permanently unhealthy or temporary unhealthy, but uh, that's what we have. And then there are some warning like panics or like uh, crashes in uh, devices that also um, not propagated any, by anybody. Typically, there is uh, some monitoring system that will collect those informa this information and uh, store it separately. And then uh, customers need to guess why pod has failed and then go to a separate monitoring system and see that device had some issues. <coughs> so um, okay, what I, I suggest... Can I say one yeah, thing? Yeah, absolutely. Here? The, those last two that you have there, the separation of, ignore devices for a second, but just in general in the Kubelet, the notion of a permanent failure versus a temporary failure is something that I think is just important in general because there's, there's other reasons that things could go wrong. Like this also happens in the topology manager, for example. If you have a topology alignment problem, that's a permanent failure, right? There's no chance you're ever going to be able to run this on this node because the constraints you put in place just, are, just aren't satisfiable here versus you know, a device happens to be busy right at the moment, but it's going to be free at some point in the future. So go ahead and keep retrying, right? Just this distinction between permanent versus temporary failure, I think, is just something that Kubelet needs in general. Um, so I just wanted to, to stress on those two. Yeah, when we discussed on workgroup uh, uh, serving, uh, Clayton had the same um, comment, like uh, permanent versus temporary is very important here. Um, I put some scenarios what I want to have in uh, closest releases of 131 uh, of Kubernetes. Uh, um, and those scenarios are in, in, uh, linked as uh, simple to harder, like uh, from what I think is simpler to what I think is harder. Um, so first scenario is just expose the status. Like today, uh, we have this uh, pod status on... Uh, um, on um, uh, pod status that we extended uh, as part of in-place vertical data scaling. And this pod status will already have how many devices we allocated. So we already, like in 131, we will have like uh, NVIDIA.com dash GPU uh, uh, and uh, number of devices that were allocated. So th this will be exposed already uh, and it's been worked on. But it wouldn't give you a status of these devices because it's just a resource list. So it's uh, like uh, static list without the health. So what we'll have is uh, just a status without uh, the health. Like, uh, and in the array world, I think it will be even more important to have some against this status. Like, I don't even know what you'll put in this status in uh, the array world. Um, we will have this uh, resource list, but um, so we need to put something here that will represent like amount of like partition of some device that we allocated or maybe like some um, some representation of the device. And I don't even know that DRA will fit into uh, extended resource model. So this, uh, we either need to exp expand this uh, field and don't, like it's currently in alpha. 
and don't put into uh, next stage, or we will need to have this field and uh, uh, DRA will expose a new field. So I think we... Go ahead. Okay. I just, uh, can you explain what that field was again? I missed what, what, what is that resource list? What's in there? Is it literally just a list of the extended resources or an account or what? everything, uh, including CPU? So in place, vertical auto scaling allows you to change CPU and uh, memory dynamically. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, we will need to understand the status, the current state, uh, how much is allocated right now. So we expose it through pod status now. And uh, since we do it for CPU and uh, memory, we also do it for all other resources as well. Today in 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 DRA. Um, we we have a claims um, list inside resources. Um, and so either we need to publish the contents of that list here somehow qualified, or we need a separate field probably. It looks like Derek's got a hand. I had a, I had a quick question, and maybe I, this is fresher in everyone else's mind but mine, but... Um, my my recollection with the device plugin framework today was that yes, if a if a device was unhealthy, then um, we encourage device plugin authors to you know de decrement the number of uh, allocatable devices by whatever that amount was unhealthy. But we didn't do anything around an unhealthy device that was being actively used by a pod. Like there was no state where the pod necessarily went failed even when the corresponding device was unhealthy unless maybe the device vendor itself went and did something proactive um yeah, for, there's, nothing for... built in, there's nothing built in to do that you're right and to be to be clear technically the, the device plugin doesn't advertise a number of devices it advertises a list of devices and yeah. a permanent stream set up and so the way that it decrements that is it resends a list that has one less device in it yeah, I guess, but Kevin, it's, it's accurate that there's nothing that actually, if a pod had been using what was once a healthy device that was now unhealthy, there was nothing that made it that that pod went into a failure state, even with the existing device plugin framework, right? I guess what I was yeah. trying to figure out is if we're mm -hmm. identifying that's, that's unless it crashes, unless it just, yeah, I'm sorry, unless it just crashes for some reason, because the device went unhealthy, it, it won't, it won't, it won't die, it won't fail to run. Yeah, so maybe my question to Sergey and the group here is if we're trying to improve that situation or to get parity with that situation. At the first, I just want to make sure that we are capable to expose this information. So people, instead of uh, going to every node and trying to call the pod resources API, they can just check the pod resource pod status and see that this pod is associated with a failed device. Um, and that link will help them understand why pod is crash looping, for instance. Today they don't know. Okay, thank you. So it'd be more informative today than proactive in terms of removing these pods or whatever. That that's how I read the response to John. It was basically, why is my pod crash looping? Maybe it's got an unhealthy device. It's up to me to decide to delete my pod. Otherwise, it might just keep looping. Yeah, so this is first uh, proposal scenario. And uh, there is also PVC status uh, caps that, uh, I don't know, uh, I I just found it uh, recently, so I, I don't know all the details, but it's, uh, it seems very, um, very similar to what we're trying to do here. So ideally, I want to get this health of a device and expose it into pod status. So today I only have this field, so likely I will need another field to expose this pod status, like healthy or unhealthy, or I will need to, edit this field to change the uh, type of a uh, resource list or something. So I don't know what would be the best uh, way to do it, but uh, if directionally we want to expose this information, I think it would be a um, great improvement for customers. Um, okay, so, 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 so if I can do that real quick, we're almost out of time. Like, so, so in the previous discussion, we talked about touch, to allocating the status back to the claim, but you're saying here, You'd want it really you run it on the pod status directly rather than on the claim status. I mean, we could potentially work around some of the issues Patrick's concerned about with having to write directly from the driver to the control plane. Maybe if we use the pod resources uh, API locally, then 
the kubelet would consume that and publish it to pod status and that would be sufficient is that what i'm hearing like we could actually kind of sidestep this issue that patrick has raised yeah that may be a good way to solve it i mean one, and, one problem um, with that is that claims can be referenced from multiple pods so you'd have to branch out to all of the pods that are referencing that claim potentially but um something to keep in mind so the pod, but, but it's driven from the pod right now, the call to that pod resources presumably is driven by the pod. So the fact that you have an association, it would just get duped, right? The, the failure status, if that's, if that claim is hit by multiple pods, it would get duped to each pod. Yeah. Yeah, uh, other scenarios listed here is uh, just a attempt to solve the problem for customers by of unscheduling ports or retrying ports, uh, but those attempts try to be as generic as possible so we don't uh, uh, break customers' assumptions about what's happening. Um, so yeah, you can uh, read uh, later because we're out of time. But I really want to see if like if people interested in this uh, port status, uh, I can uh, try to craft uh, some API proposal and uh, care for this. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe we can sync up on Slack afterward. Um, any other comments before we close? Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody.